Bienvenidos a la conferencia de la doctora Cristina Yanis. Es para mí realmente un gran honor poder presentarla y que haya aceptado participar de esta reunión. Y para quienes venimos trabajando en ungulados y en paleobiología y anatomía, es alguien que prácticamente no necesita presentación, pero bueno, para los demás, eh, mencionarles que Yanis... Eh, es una paleontóloga de vertebrados que se formó principalmente en anatomía eh, y actualmente está, desarrolla sus actividades como profesora honoraria en ciencias de la tierra y paleobiología en la Universidad de Bristol, en el Reino Unido. Y, sin embargo, continúa vinculada como profesora emérita con el Departamento de Ecología y Biología Evolutiva de la Universidad de Brown, en Estados Unidos. Sus principales intereses de investigación se centran en los grandes mamíferos del Cenozoico, en la anatomía funcional y los patrones evolutivos, aunque tiene también trabajos que se han publicado en dinosaurios y eh, los primeros tetrápodos. Eh, en sus inicios de la carrera, ella empezó con el estudio del cráneo, los dientes, relacionándolo con la dieta. Eh, es la que, si bien no lo define, es la que hace el primer listado enorme de, de ungulados eh, y una buena base de datos que hoy en día todavía la van a seguir viendo en varios artículos, eh, estandarizando el índice de exodoncia, a partir del cual varios han seguido esa metodología pero en la actualidad está más enfocada en el estudio de las extremidades y la locomoción. Eh, y los objetos de estudio que la, le competen hoy en día son el de lo, la evolución en la locomoción de los caballos y de los canguros. Eh, ha sido galardonada como paleontóloga y profesora, es conocida por sus aportes fundamentales a la bibliografía de mamíferos, eh, examinando el cambio anatómico a través del tiempo. Eh, es también coautora del libro Vertebral Life, así que bueno, uno podría seguir eh, enumerando realmente su carrera y su trayectoria, que es realmente extensa, pero bueno, eh, sin más, eh, los dejo entonces con Cristín eh, para que les presente su charla. Cristín, the audience is all yours. Ok. Okay, well, thank you very much for having me here, everybody. And um, I'm sorry I'm not in Argentina, perhaps next year, you never know. Anyway, I wanted to talk to you today about horse evolution, something that's interested me for many years, but I didn't really start working on until quite recently or quite late in my career, really. And uh, this is a traditional view of horse evolution. It's like um, time and progress, um, you know, it's gonna give you these bigger and better and more complex forces over time. And this is very reminiscent of, um, of another familiar icon, this idea of human evolution. And this is really sort of a specter of orthogenesis. It's like this idea that over time we get this sort of increasingly um, perfect form until there's only one left. And certainly today we only have left one genus of, of equids, that's a genus equus. And now more recent views do tend to um, acknowledge that the tree of horse evolution, of equid evolution, is much more bushy than that straight lined view here. But even so, equus is still always portrayed as sort of the ultimate goal here. It's like our ultimate, uh, um, um, our ultimate, you know, evolutionary goal. And um, here's the thing. I mean, many of my best friends have been equus, long for genus equus, okay? But we mustn't forget that there's many other players in horse evolution. This is me with a, a little soft toy of hyperhippus from the mid and Anchor from the mid Marcy of North America. And before you ask, yes, it is the only one. Okay, so um, more recent views of horse evolution still will acknowledge the trees, you know, bushy, but they, we really need to look at the so-called serious side branches here in order to understand better what's been going on through equid evolutionary history. So these are a couple of the groups I'm gonna focus on. But first I want to look a little bit at you know, what does make equus different? And is it really different from other equids? So this is the phylogeny, mainly based on McFadden. It's uh, a new tree done by uh, my friend and colleague, Nuria Melissa Morales-Garcia. 
And um, so th this is to introduce you to some of the, uh, to the phylogeny of the equity. So there are three subfamilies. Um, the equini is the modern one that contains equus and that's monophyletic. Then we had the, um, the equini have been around since the early Marcine. Then we have the Anchitherini here that's paraphyletic, that's been around from the late Eocene to the late Miocene. And the early guys in the early Eocene were Hyracotherini, um, also paraphyletic. We're not going to discuss those at all. Um, a little more information in this phylogeny is that animals facing to the left are old world ones, and to the right are new world ones, although um, Equus did originate in the new world, even though now it's only found in the old world. Um, even though the Anchitherini is paraphyletic, there's a monophyletic group within here. Um, the Anchitherini, so that's an important group. We're going to think about their Marcine group. And then within the Equini, we have three tribes. We have the Protohippini and the Hipparionini. And together, together, these are the sort of Hipparians, they are sister clades. And then to then the sister to these two is the Equini, which includes Equus, as I mentioned before. It also includes um, this really cool South American horse in the Pleistocene called Hippidion, which uh, had its sort of strange complex nose and very short legs, a big animal, big, a size of a modern horse. Um, Unfortunately, I'm not going to talk about this animal at all, even though it's really interesting because I don't know much about it, but um, just to mention it, it, it is a member of this subfamily. And then uh, today, of course, the genus Equus is solely in the old world, apart from feral members of the uh, Equus cabalus, such as the uh, Mustang in um, North America and the Brumby in Australia. Okay, getting a bit hot. I'm getting. A little, a little horse here myself to English. Okay. So, what makes Equus Equus? What's so good about being Equus? A traditional thing that's always touted is its hips a lot, which has high crown seat teeth. Um, hips of animals are broadly tend to be grazers, ones that are bracket don't tend to be browsers. It's a bit more complex than that, but we haven't got time for that right now. But Hypsodonty is actually seen in all the subfamily Equini, and increases in Hypsodonty occurred convergently in the Protohippines, in the Hipparionines, as well as in the Equines. So it's most certainly not something that is unique to Equus. Another thing would be large body size. Here we have a modern Equus looking at a little Hyracotherium. But again, that's not unique to Equus. And in fact, larger body size evolved over, by, by larger body size, I mean over 100 kilograms. That evolved convergently, again, in protohippines, Hipparians, as well as Equines, plus over here in the Anchitherines. So larger body size has evolved a number of times convergently with an equine, it's not equine, it's not it's not equus thing. And then finally, monodactyly, having a single toe. Here we have a, a, a foot of hipparion showing the tridactyl condition. And in equus, these, um, these digits have been reduced to little side toes here. And well, they've been reduced just to, to, uh, just to metapodial splints, as opposed to complete side toes. Now, monodactyly actually is only seen in Equus. Um, and uh, it's sort of seen um, some, of the, some of the less derived equine, like Plyohippus, are losing their side toes. But actual monodactyly is seen Equus, and it's seen in some other genera like Hippidion, Dinohippus, Astrohippus. So that is a unique thing to Equus. But a more important thing really in terms of horse evolution isn't becoming a monodactyl. It's getting what's called a spring foot. Okay, and I'm gonna spend a little bit of a time trying to explain what the spring foot is. 
and why it's important. So this is a picture of a, a sort of bisected foot of a modern horse. And it's showing here, this is the metapodials, the three phalanges, the distal, the, the, the ungual phalanx is enclosed in a, in a keratinous hoof. There's a fetlock joint there, there's a sesamoid bones. These are gonna be features we're gonna look at again. So I'm, I'm pointing them out here. Um, Tridactyl equines would have had um, a similar central toe. But you look at the tape here, it doesn't have, it doesn't stand with a fully unguilla grade foot posture as do modern horses. It stands with a sort of halfway semi unguilla grade foot posture. It's got a big foot pad here and little individual hooves around the toes. And the basal equids, like the mesohippus here, would have had something that was sort of in between these two conditions. They would also have had a semi unguilla grade foot posture with a foot pad. So it's not until you actually get to um, the subfamily Aquini that you see this fully unguligated kind of foot, which has this point out to you in a minute what the string foot means. So with this fully unguligated foot posture, what you can do is then lengthen, well, you, can then, you then have a longer reach of these flexor tendons. Um, that can then act to store elastic energy in the foot during locomotion, as sort of shown here. So as the foot comes down, the fetlock joint um, extends, can almost touch the floor here, as you can see here, and elastic energy is stored in these tendons, and that can recover up to about 50% of the energy that's being used in locomotion. So this is a very um, interesting innovation in terms of making the foot more efficient. It's not just for speed, it's gonna make it more efficient at all gates when you can have a fetlock flexion like this. And you have the tendons here and then shown here in green is this um, suspensory apparatus, which helps to stop the foot from, hy from hyperextending. So these are all features of the family Equini, not just, not just Equus. And it's also seen, I, think, I don't think I can go backwards here, but it's also seen in some of the derived anchotheas that are basal to the equines. And you can tell this from the soft anatomy because there are various features of the anatomy that, um, that tell you that this foot pathology ha has occurred. Basically, you've got a longer first phalanx. Here's equus compared to hypohippus. You've got an extension of the metapodial ridge onto the cranial surface of the bone that locks the foot into a, a parasitical movement. And then in the volar view, the plantar view of the first phalanx, you see this very deep V scar. That's for those, um, that's a, that, that shows that the, whole, that, that the suspensory ligament apparatus is sort of in place and preventing hyperextension of the fet fetlock with that unguilla grade foot posture. So we can tell from the soft anatomy when this foot anatomy comes in. So basically this is sort of showing you that in a tape here or in a basal equid like mesohippus, you would have little storage of elastic energy. But um, in a spring-footed equid, which they said the equini and the derived anchotheas, the foot that extension you know, is going to stretch those tendons, resulting in the, the storage and then recovery of elastic energy when, when the foot leaves the ground again. So that's a really important innovation, and it certainly, you know, is not confined to equus. But the thing is, equus is monodactyl. So that spring foot will come in about at, at this level here, okay? But equus is the only fault to become monodactyl. And normally we, that's the only thing we think of about, oh, you lose the side toes, but why become monodactyl? And that really isn't clear. And it's something I've worked on, on a bit, but I still think it's not fully understood. The classical idea, if you lose the side toes, you end up with a lighter foot and therefore faster locomotion and more efficient locomotion because the foot isn't as heavy. But the question is, is that really true? The single toe of Equus is actually a lot more robust than the middle toe of the tridactyl equines. 
And also, as you look here, the metapodial is actually shorter. And we always think of equus as being particularly long-legged, but actually it isn't. I'll come back to that later on. It doesn't have particularly long legs. It actually has shorter metapodials than the tridactyl forms. Um, and is this foot actually any lighter, being more robust and with a bigger central toe? That hasn't really been tested. I think that's something that needs to be looked into. But what I've pointed out in my work with Ray Benor is that what you see in the monodactyl horses, even in those that are incipiently monodactyl, like Plowhippus here, is you get an enlargement of the proximal sesamoid bones that are part of the whole um, system that anchors these, these, uh, this um, suspensory apparatus. And you get a deeper V scar on the first phalanx. Again, so this is part of the whole suspense of the apparatus system. So it looks like what's going on with these horses, even before they become completely monodactyl, is they have um, a boosted up suspensory apparatus system. And perhaps it's indicating they have more flexor at the fetlock, greater elastic energy storage in those flexor tendons. And also the other thing you see in horses that are monodactyl is they have a stiffer back. This is the pelvis of a, of a, of a hipparion compared to equus and then plowhippus. That's our, um, that's our equine that's losing the side toes. They have a sort of stiffer, a sort of more fused up sacrum, a stiffer lumbar region. So that's another thing that's going along with becoming monodactyl. So again, it's hard to know exactly what happened in the past and why it happened. But the proposed hypothesis that I have with Ravenor is that the trot gait is the favorite endurance gait of modern equids. And we know from some footprint data that uh, Hipparionians actually have this running walk kind of gait that you see today in um, things like and my slantic horses and pasifinos. And um, so maybe it's the adoption of it. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm really making this argument very quickly here, very much contracting it. You can read about this in this paper. But maybe this adoption of a trot gait and a more stiff back gait um, would have promoted endurance over agility. And um, with a more bolstered up suspensory apparatus, then the side toes will not touch the ground in any foot position. And then maybe that's where they were lost because they were no longer of any utility. And this kind of change of gait and change of a, you know, better elastic energy storage in the, in the uh, ligaments of the leg may have been particularly important in the Pleistocene when you would have a colder and more arid climate and maybe you would need to do more roaming per day for food. <coughs> And so efficiency of locomotion would have been at a premium. <coughs> Sorry. I'm not, used, <coughs> I'm not used to talking, living at home during COVID. Okay, so um, again, we don't know exactly why Equus became Mardactyl, Equ the Equini became Mardactyl, but um, it's not, I think it's a due, I, I'm, I'm pretty sure it's a due with endurance and not any kind of um, faster locomotion. Okay, so now we're going to look at some of the other kinds of, of, of equids and think, you know, what they did that was different to equids. So the Hipparians remain tridactyl in the main. There are a few of them who get a bit of reduction in, the, in their side toes, but uh, not to any kind of extent, even as much as that picture of the plyohippus I showed you. They were longer legged than equus, and they had a more flexible back than the equini. They were liable and more agile load of, mode of locomotion, but not the sort of endurance of the equini. And they were also more morphologically diverse and species rich than the equine during the Marcine, and individually more numerous as fossils. 
So I need to explain this figure to you because people always read it as being species diversity. It's not, it's looking at how many types of horses you get in lo fossil localities. So, so a couple of things here to think about first though, in terms of what was going on over time, it was the Agatherines that first migrated over to the old world in the early Marcine. Hipparians followed them in the late Marcine, early, early late Marcine. Equus didn't get to the old world until the Pleistocene. And then Hipparians become extinct by the end of the Miocene. Hipp Pleistocene, <laughs> Hipp Hipp okay. Anchitheus become extinct by the end of the Miocene and the Hipparians sort of squeak into the Pleistocene, but don't last more than about a million years into the Pleistocene. How much of this was competition with Equus? How much of it was climate change? Um, they're declining th through the later part of the Miocene. I think it's mainly to do with climate change. And Equus is sort of fortuitously adapted to, to deal well with the colder and arid climate of the Pleistocene. Um, there's a really good new paper out that covers the old world of parian radiation, which is Ray Bernor and colleagues, uh, 2021. If you're interested in these taxa, in these horses, I'd really recommend reading that paper. But then a couple more points here. Um, one thing is interesting in general, but a bit tangential to this talk, is there are more equids per locality in North America, in the Marcine than there were in the old world. And exactly why that was, it's hard to know. It might have been because when the, when the um, equids went to the old world, they were in competition with bovids, whereas bovids didn't get over to the new world until the Pleistocene. But here's a more important point to make, is that is if you look at the number of, 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 of hipparians here, the hipparians are more morphologically diverse. There are lots of dwarf forms, and they were more individually abundant than the equini and the Pliocene. So even though the equini ended up being very successful, this genus Equus in the Pleistocene, they were a pretty minor part of the fauna all through the Miocene. So they weren't always champions, you know? I'm just trying to sort of say yay for the Hipparians here. Okay, so back to the Anchitheas here in green, and we're gonna look at those. So these are a really interesting group, and they, I think, are, are, are much neglected. This is a great picture I just found on the web today, it makes it look a bit like a deer, but it's not meant to be a hyperhippus, but they probably were not that much like extant horses. Okay, so this is actually a phylogeny that I got Melissa to do of an anchitherine centric phylogeny, making them the outcome of fourth evolution, just, just because. But you can see here, there were three genera in North America and two in Eurasia. And this is a picture, it's a, North, it's, it's a diorama from the American Museum of Natural History from the early late Marcine, showing these guys all living together in a, in a, in a savannah woodland habitat. So there's Dinohippus here, who's an equine. Nanohippus is a dwarf, or one of the dwarf hipparians and hyperhippus uh, uh, anchitheria here. So how are they different from other equids? Okay, well, in terms of their skeleton, they had long metapodials, like the hipparians, and a flexible back, like the hipparians. Equus, as, I remember, as you may remember, had a shorter, more, more stiff back, but they have side toes that are longer and more splayed out than those you see in the Hipparians. Um, and they retained a pad foot, they didn't have the spring foot. And uh, at least Hyperhippus, we don't know about the other genera, has a long neck. In terms of the skull, they really were quite different, not only from Equus, but from other Equines. This is Megahippus, who's sort of the most derived of the Anchitherians in terms of the skull. They don't take this necessarily as typical, but it is an example of the fact they were different um, from the um, Hipparian, from, from the other equids. So here we have, we can see how equus is derived here. It's got a complete post-orbital bar. 
It's got hips, it's got teeth, it's got an elongated face and a rather broad muzzle. All these things go along with um, this being a grazer. It's also got an elongated um, mesoteric, ridge, mesoteric ridge here, probably had a bigger volume of uh, jaw musculature here, especially the matter's muscle. Again, that's going along with being a grazer. But on the other hand, um, Megahippus here seems to have been um, a very specialized browser. This facial fossa is actually found in most of the Aquini, so don't worry about that, but it doesn't get the post-orbital bar. It's got a salt face still, but it's got this big flange at the back of the head cheeks. It's probably for an enlarged temporalis muscle. And rather than the broad jaw of uh, broad muscle of uh, Equus, it's got a rather narrow muzzle, but with very procumbent incisors. So this really looks quite unlike anything else amongst the equity. And like I said, Megahippus is the most derived of these guys in terms of the skull morphology, but it does show you how different Ankytherians were from the equids. And we did a bit of quantification on this, um, try to show, we did the, the tooth volume here is, is doesn't, it doesn't include the, it's just the volume of the cheek teeth above the jaw against the lower molar row length as a proxy for body size. And it sort of shows how compared to the equines and indeed all the horses, the agathirines have lot, a, a bigger volume of teeth for their size. And actually, this actually shows you the tooth row, upper tooth row of megahippus compared to a grevis zebra. This is the same size. They have massive teeth, massive cheek teeth. It isn't really quite captured here, probably because you really can't use you use molar row length as a proxy for size, you know, you're in a bit of a problem because their molar row lengths are longer and all these points should be up over here somewhere. Um, but I mean, they, they definitely were different, the horses. So they were probably some kind of highly specialized browsers. Long necks, massive bracket on cheek teeth, enlarged for company sizes, so they were doing something very different and they were, as we pointed out before, living alongside in the Miocene savannas along with the equines, along with the grazing equid forms. So they were rather like in some ways, you know, kudu in Africa today compared to the wildebeest. They, uh, and they went extinct in the late Miocene when the climate changed, but they were a highly successful radiator for their time and they have been really overlooked in the evolutionary story. Now, again, if we look at their feet, we saw this picture before, and we use hyperhippus as an example of the pad foot. And so it, has, it, has, it doesn't have the derived features you see in the Aquini, it shows they have a spring foot. But was this just a retention of the basal equid condition? Or are they doing something a little different? And what we did here, we did um, a principal components analysis of 17 linear measurements of the third metatarsal and the proximal phalanx. And PC1 is size because it's um, it's uh, it's uh, it's uh, it was uh, it, it was just um, untransformed variables. If you plot PC2 against PC3, you see a very clear separation of the Ankytherians here, away from the spring-footed forms here. That's the Hipparians, the, equi the Equins, and also the stem Ankytherians here. So they're not just doing what these basal guys like Metahippus are doing, they are moving off in the opposite direction from the horses. So what separates things out along the axes here is that going in this direction are the various indicators of the spring foot, the long proximal phallus, the extensive V scar. But over here is a very, it's a broader fetlock joint. And again, here on the PC3 here, going loading highly here is a long third metatarsal. And that you see particularly in the Hipparians. And loading down here is a broader fetlock joint. So actually, it's quite a broad fetlock joint in, in, the, in, in Equus because it's monodactyl. And, um, but it does have proportionally short metapodials something that I think really has not been appreciated. Okay, 
Yes, we said so. So this might be related to the condition of being both larger and more adaptable. But, it, but, but don't forget that hyperhippus is the same size. So this is also a big animal. It's also the size of a horse, but it has these much longer metapodials. So this shows that the ankyserine foot is not simply a larger version of the basal equid foot, but has its own unique characters that I think are indic indicative of greater foot stability. And we'll try to explain why that is in a minute. So a possible reason for the divergence in the feet here, we look before here at increasing body size of over 100 kilograms. And we saw it happened convergently in the Ankyferins, in the Protohippins, in the Hipparionians, in the Equids. But there's another point in health evolution about in the late Oligocene, where everyone gets larger compared to earlier forms. So this, at this point, everybody is over 50, 50 kilograms. Even some of these tiny little dwarf Hipparians are still over 50 kilograms. So, um, and that's when you have like a split in horse evolution, if you like. You have this lot over here going off in this direction, evolving a string foot. And these guys, the Ankyserians, who are doing something different, diverging away from the basal condition, but in a different direction. And what's interesting is, well, what's so important about 50 kilograms? And it turns out it might be a very important thing indeed. Now, I'm not going to try and explain this graph because it's done by smart people who I, <laughs> smart biomechanic people. But it turns out that 50 kilograms, thereabouts, is an important sort of turning point in locomotive biomechanics. Be below this point, uh, animals are constrained by power. Above this point, they're constrained by work. Maximum speed maximizes at about this size. So here's something you see, the cheetah is about 50 kilograms. But that's this whole point in horse evolution when you go up to here until you get to about that level where you split between the equines and ankyserines. And then past this point, they're under a different kind of constraint on the biomechanics. So I think, I, I just I can, can I go back? Yes, I can. Okay. So here, I think, is you've got this change in size, and the anchor theory is a coping with increased size one way, and the um, equines and, and some of the stem stem equine anchor theory here are coping with the increased size in a, a different way. And exactly what ex exactly what the anchor theories are doing with their feet, it's hard to tell, and that really requires more work. But the point is being they're not just a bigger version. They're not a bigger version of, a, of, of something here like Mesohippus, either in the skull or in the feet. They're a very unique group doing something different from all the other equids, and they need to, have to be championed, I think. OK, so I'm actually getting to this talk faster than I thought I would, but there we go, we can all break the tea. Um, so in summary, um, the Aquini was they, they were a very successful and widespread genus during the Pleistocene. But this is just sort of overshadows the fact that they were the last guys left, they were the last horses left for sure. Um, and they, but they were doing something that I think they lucked out. I think they were doing something that made them lucky. Oh, just a point here, these guys here ought to be over here. They've changed the phylogenetics since now. So these protohippines ought to be on this side. But, um, but the Aquini was, a, was, a, was not a particularly diverse lineage. And it wasn't particularly morphologically diverse either. Um, Hippidian actually was. Hippidian gets that funny possible proboscis and very short feet and all other kinds of things. But you, know, but you don't get any dwarf lineages in the Aquini. They're not playing around with doing different kinds of things like the Hipparionian and so, so if you look back at this whole diversity here, you wouldn't necessarily think that this lineage was going to make it big, you know, and exactly why it did, again, I think monodactyly ended up being a really good thing for horses in the Pleistocene, but I don't think it was something that was necessarily, you know, 
it was it was it it, it was a good i it was a good idea only for a, for a small number a small number of horses here exactly what they were doing differently in the Maya scene is hard to say maybe they were ranging more widely for food back then and that gave them an advantage in the Pleistocene when it really got cold and arid and you really at that point had to locomotive efficiency was really at a premium in contrast the Hipparians were also hypsilont and larger body size and had the spring foot but they didn't show much of a trend to reduce their side toes and become monodactyl. So being monodactyl is like a strange thing to do in the grand scheme of horse evolution. This, this is a picture done by North Americans, so it doesn't really give you much credit to the old world. Hipparians were in fact more diverse over in the old world than they were in the new world, but there you go. Um, so, um, so, but the point is, is that for most of horse evolution, it was the Hipparians who were the important guys. They were the ones who um, had the who who were diverse in terms of species, more diverse in terms of morphology, and more geographically widespread, and also more individually numerous at fossil localities. So it, it didn't have to be Equus. Equus got lucky, I think. If you look back at this point of horse evolution you wouldn't pick out the equini as being the ones who are going to make it. And then finally, the Ankyserini were a very successful lineage in the earlier part of the, well, in the middle to early late Marcine. They were persistently brachiodont, they were probably specialized browsers, but they were also of large body size. They were an important component of the Marcine fauna. And they had this unique kind of foot morphology that was divergent from the spring foot seen over here in the equine. Okay, so basically that's the talk. I finished a bit early. I'm, I'm welcome to take questions. I want to thank my various co-authors here. Um, Ray Bernard is a long-time old colleague. Um, Nick and, and, and Edward here were, were well, it was, was, was an undergraduate at Bristol. I was also a graduate student. Nick was an undergraduate at Brown many years ago. Uh, also, of course, thanks to the um, curators and staff at the American Museum of Natural History for giving me access to the vertebrate paleontology collections that were very important. And thanks to Melissa for the illustrations. And finally, thanks to my latest Equus friend. I still like Equus. I just think they've been overrated. Bueno, Christine. Thank you very much for uh, being in our meeting, uh, for your presentation and your talk. Así que, bueno, la despedimos a Cristina y le agradecemos por, por su charla. Thank you very much, Cristina. Okay, thank you.